you better have a plan in place if you want to proceed to ask for more money that's intentional. It could be, hey, do you think I can or maybe you will? No, you want to have a plan and a, and a tactic that you put into place that puts the debt stacking in your favor to get that yes. And there's a way to do that. It doesn't necessarily mean it works every time, but you want to ask in a way that you're going to get a yes more times than you get a no. Welcome to the Raise Up Podcast. We are back again, and I'm your host, Amanda Lefevre, and we have an incredible guest for today's show. J.D. Phillips is an entrepreneur who has spent 25 years in the financial services industry, helping clients successfully create and implement savings and retirement income plans. In addition to that, he's also a master sales trainer and team builder who once built a sales distribution team of over 50 thousand representatives. He's a professional speaker who has delivered messages of strategy, success principles, and inspiration to corporate and national audiences throughout the U.S. Most recently, J.D. served as a consultant and contributor to a national best-selling book entitled How Money Works. J.D., thank you so much for being on the show. Well, Amanda, thank you. It's my pleasure, and I'm excited to be part of your program what I've heard about it is nothing but amazing things. So hopefully we can add a tidbit or two. Yeah, I'm really excited. And first I have to ask before we get started, how uh, how are you guys doing? COVID-19 has been rough on a lot of companies. How is your team and your family kind of coping with the shutdowns? Well, interestingly enough, um, our team and our business has actually spiked during this time because we are a virtual business now. So being home had it had its advantages for, for sure and as far as the family um our, we have twins boy girl twins now we're lucky amanda they both look like their mama so that's a good thing <laughs> and number two um they are juniors in college so they were forced home with the uh with the virus and we've been quarantining and they've been doing their school online here and now throughout the summer to make up for lost time but everybody's mm-hmm. safe and healthy and we're glad to to be all together for a little while. And listen, when they're at home and they're six years old, it's one thing. When they're (laughs) home, when they're 22, it's a whole different thing. We don't carry quite the weight we used to. (laughs) It's probably like a whole different dynamic. And just uh, turn the page, so they say. Turn the page. page. (laughs) And interesting, too, to be home with mom and dad. Now, do they go to the same school? They they don't. They don't. They're, They're diametrically opposite when it comes to school and study. So our son is an accounting major down at Ole Miss, down in the South, and is loving that entire culture and all that goes with it. Our daughter's a, in, in pastoral ministry. She's studying at Lee University outside of uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, near Chattanooga. And uh, they they both do their thing, man. And um, she's, um, she's actually going to graduate this year. She's going to do four years of college in three. She's anxious to get after it. So we're we're real happy for, for her and proud of both of them. That's amazing. I'm so glad you guys are safe and healthy and, and exploring new bonding ways <laughs> <That's it. That's laughs> to be a family. Well, um, as you know, our show is all about someone improving their financial situation, like getting a raise at their job. So given all that's going on, if a personal friend came to you and said, this is a tough time, but... I've earned a raise. I think I've earned a raise at work. How do you recommend I go about making that happen? How else How else would you help them? Well, I would tell you, first of all, you know, things in life that we do, important things in life, always start with a why. Because if we can get to somebody's why, whether it be a new job, a raise, uh, another position or another step in their relationship, even personally, that gets you to an emotional level. So, the first thing that I would share with somebody if they said that is, okay, well, why do you want it? What are the, what are some of the significant reasons to, to get a raise? And first of all, it really kind of boils down to a little bit of math. If they're working for a corporation, a more money in, in the form of a raise would mean a larger contribution to their 401k if they're participating for that in work, because it's always a uh, percentage of your salary. The, the second thing is that, that's really amazing is, it could contribute to their income in such a way they'd have more money to save. And more money to save is important, not only 
for a raise from a perspective of more cash flow through what your increase would be, but it also gives you a better way to plan for your future. So when you begin to think about getting a raise, why do you want it? And, and get emotionally charged about the benefits of having it, because that'll put you in the, in the right mindset to begin to formulate your strategy. So I would tell you, always start with your why and why do you want it and why is that important? And then develop the strategy from there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because when you're looking at it as just, I want more money, it's really hard to kind of strategize around that. If you have the, I want more money because of this, or I want to be able to do this, it, I don't know, it lends a different weight to it somehow. So, you know, man, that brings up a great point that you just reminded me of. I had a mentor long ago, very wise business owner, entrepreneur type, and he sat me down one day. I was struggling with a decision on which way I should go, which step I should take next. And he said, you know, J.D., there's one thing you should always remember from this day forward. Whenever you're faced with a business decision or choice or direction you want to take, take the time to sit yourself down and ask yourself the two-word question. The two-word question is, for what? I'm getting ready to make this decision for what? I'm going to take this next step for what? I'm doing this job for what? And if, if you'll take the time to do that, what it will do is it'll bring your the subconscious out of oblivion and it'll help you laser focus on exactly what your what your next step and focus should be. And once you get your mind there, it allows you to make the right preparations for whatever the next step, in fact, will be. So I would offer that to all your listeners as use that tool for yourself. When you get to a situation, in this case, if you're asking for more money or a raise, bump and pay, however you want to refer to it, start with that two word question for what? and see if that doesn't help you focus. I like that. And so it's more of a way to uncover and figure out what exactly you're doing this for and why, and then get some clarity. Is that kind of what you're saying? It will. You'll be amazed. You know, we first talked just a few minutes ago about, you know, when you ask yourself why, that gets you to an emotional level. Then you ask the question for what, that begins to put you in direction and into motion. And you're exactly right. It's about clarity and intention. If you're asking for more money at whatever level you are, if you're brand new at your job, you've been there a year or you've been there 10 years or whatever your number is, you better have a plan in place if you want to proceed to ask for more money that's intentional. It could be, hey, do you think I can or maybe you will? No, you want to have a plan and a, and a tactic that you put into place that puts the debt stacking in your favor to get that yes. And there's a way to do that. It doesn't necessarily mean it works every time, but you want to ask in a way that you're going to get a yes more times than you get a no. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds kind of like one of our guests before was talking about laying groundwork. And it sounds a little bit like, like actually doing that. Have you learned any specific ways to kind of gain some groundwork before you have that conversation? Well, I would have to agree with that. And, and I'm a little bit old school. So uh, I would tell you that we live in this digital technology age. I mean, look at your, your podcast here, all the most modern tools and, and technology to get these messages out. But believe it or not, the, and, and we have email and we all know email, which has now become almost a dinosaur to, um, to some extreme, <laughs> by um, some measure, but yet it's still very effective in getting information from point A to point B. Uh, but believe it or not, the old fashioned, I mean, the written word seems to still carry a whole lot of weight. And I often will tell people, if you're getting ready to uh, ask your manager, your boss, whoever your supervisor or superior is for your raise, first of all, you want to ask for permission to ask. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And if I have a review coming up, let's say I have a six month review coming up or I have a performance review come up for the year. Prior to that review, I might ask you if you're my supervisor, Amanda, during this time, can we spend a few minutes talking about my compensation? Mm -hmm. Because I want to put the, the idea in your head that that's coming. So when we're having our review, I don't have to sit around wondering, well, gosh, I wonder if this is a good time to bring this up. Once I plant that seed um, and you say, well, sure or we can talk about it, or whatever the response is, don't worry about it if it's not the response you want because you haven't given the reason yet. 
You're just telling them, hey, I want to open the door so we can both step in and have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, then what I often will share with people, believe it or not, you can do this in person. But if you'll take the time and you put your thoughts down on paper and quote unquote, write a letter Mm -hmm. to your supervisor, explaining to them why you want what you want and why it's justified. And you can list certain reasons. You can list certain facts. You can list certain performance results before you ever walk in the door Mm -hmm. and drop that to them prior to your meeting. Well, guess what happens now? You don't, you now know that they know what's on the front of your brain. And when you get to that point of discussion, it won't be awkward. And they may prepare a response that might surprise you. And if not, at least you have set the table so you can have the discussion. That's true. And so you go in and you kind of ask permission to ask before. So you're laying that groundwork there and then actually prepare a letter beforehand to give them. And then they're prepared and not blindsided. Is that kind of, I don't know what the strategy is around that? Exactly. It's the perfect word. It's a strategy. And the tactic of that strategy is this. First of all, you'll separate yourself. Nobody else is doing it Mm -hmm. or very few because they won't take the time because you have to thoughtfully prepare the letter and think through. And I made a note here about the letter as, you know, what, what would you list? Well, if you write the letter, you're writing it. That means you're in control of what you say, how you want to say it. And you can put uh, paint the picture with the exact colors that you want to paint it with. So you're not in there all of a sudden getting a question back from your supervisor and you're trying to answer on the fly. Right. So you can take inventory in this letter and you can explain, well, this has happened since my last pay raise. I've picked up these skills. I've taken on this leadership role. We had success in this project. I performed X percent over quota. Whatever the case may be, you can strategically place it in writing in front of them. Then the supervisor or boss or whoever it might be when they receive that, well, it gives them a chance to evaluate that. And they may not even remember, be aware, understand, but it lets them know exactly where you're coming from. And you're not asking just to ask. Right. You're not asking because we all know, don't ever ask for a raise because, hey, Amanda, I need a raise because I need more money. Mm-hmm. That, that never works because everybody needs more money. So your, your reason is, remember now, for what? And we're back to the question. Well, the letter helps you identify that very specific answer that's presented to your manager or supervisor before you have that meeting. Mm -hmm. And when you walk in, everybody knows besides whatever's on their mind, they know exactly what's on your mind. That's true. So is the for what and your why, is that something that you actually share with your manager as well? Or is that not something that's like your own personal awareness? Well, that's a great question. And I would share it depending on the relationship I have with my boss supervisor, or if it's appropriate, some of it might be personal and not appropriate in the workplace to even share. Some of it they may not care about. You might have a a manager or supervisor that's only interested in black and white facts and figures. And if you hit this number, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Well, they have no, trust me, they have no lost love over what your for what or why is. It doesn't matter to them, Yeah, but it matters to you. But that's the point. That's why you have that discussion with yourself as you prepare. It's because you want your mindset to be such that you are justified in asking for what you want. And you're justified because here's one of the mental dilemmas and hurdles that people struggle with when asking for a raise. Sometimes they think, well, maybe I'm not really worth it. Mm. Have this self-worth equation in their brain as well. I'm not as good as so-and-so, or I didn't do as much as you-know-who, or all of a sudden they begin to doubt their their worth and their value. That's why you have the discussions with yourself. That's why you take the inventory, and that's why you list the things that are important to prove that you bring more value, which equates to more pay. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it would almost be a confidence booster, too. Oh, there's no question it's a confidence booster. And almost like a television program or a movie, you know, a movie that has a script and the script has been rehearsed and then delivered. Well, you get to focus on delivery because you know the words without rehearsal. You don't know the words. Mm. And so you might present a great message 
in the wrong way because you didn't practice the words. You didn't know exactly what to say or how to say it. And you're more focused on what am I going to say next instead of how am I going to say it? Yes. Because the how to of presenting will be just as important as the what to that you present. Yeah, because I can I can see too, those conversations, there's a lot of energy. And usually from what I've heard, it's a lot of anxious energy and people are nervous and they're reciting it over and over and they're worrying about what's going to happen. And so it sounds like all of this really helps not alleviate or get rid of the worry, but it helps it so that you feel more confident going in. Well, you do, number one, because the um, supervisor or boss is not going to be shocked. Hmm. They, they already know what you want as part of your review or as part of the conversation or the ask because you presented it to them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And the uh, trick is once you present your value, be very specific. Remember now we're intentional in our tactic, but now we're going to be specific in our ask. You don't want some money. You don't want some more money. Mm -hmm. You want a number, right? You want $5,000 more per year. You want 5% more based on your annual pay. Present your ask in the form of a specific number, either by pay period or by year, or as a, a, a function of percentage, a 10% increase based on all the things that I have validated through my preparation. And when you, if you're specific, then now you've given them why you want it, why you deserve it, what your value is. And oh, by the way, take the time when you do this. If you're at uh, one, let's say you're 40,000 a year and you're trying to get to 45. Mm -hmm. well, are the people around you that do what you do, whether it's in your company or across the street of the competitor, does their job pay 45,000 for those same skill sets? or experience levels and use the market around you to make sure that you're getting paid what the market pays. Now, if you can get more for that, well, that, that would come down to how great of a negotiator you might be. But for sure, if I know that the fella across the street in that cubicle makes 45 and I do what he does plus some, well, I'm going to use that information to say, Hey, over at you know, Acme corporation, they pay 45 for what I'm doing and I'm doing it better based on these st uh, stats and facts. So using the marketplace to help you evaluate and then measure your own worth can be a very effective tool. Mm -hmm. I love that. So a little bit of market research to c try and figure out exactly what everybody else is getting paid in that position. So one question that I did want to ask is, what if somebody is ready like right now? They feel like they've earned it and they're worth it. Do you say wait until you've laid the groundwork or you charge in there and ask for what you want? Well, that's going to be what we call a feel thing. If you really feel it, then, you know, certainly I wouldn't ever tell somebody not to go for it if they really feel they're prepared and ready. I would say this, just because you're ready and you're itching to go and you want to scratch that itch doesn't mean they're ready. Mm -hmm. Think about it. What if you charged into the day after they just got their quarterly returns and and they're down 15% from last year quarter? And that's the day you pick to run in and, and drop the bomb on them that you're you're the next superstar and need to be paid that way. Well, you might have the greatest pitch in the world, but if it comes at the wrong time, it's not going to matter what you say because it's going to fall on deaf ears or one that somebody might be in a bad mood. So I wouldn't tell you not to do that. I would just say double check your timing mm -hmm. that you don't, you know, go shoot off your best firecracker and then have nobody there to, to listen to it pop. That's true. Oh, I like that. I like that analogy <laughs> too. That's really good. So have you had people approach you and, and tell you that they were going to ask about their compensation or wanted to talk about it? Have you seen this whole strategy play out before? Yeah. Well, so yeah, you know, I'll answer in two parts. I've never had somebody come to me and, and, and prep me for that. Now, lots of times is because in the type of or work and industry I've been in, it's never been a salary type position where you're going to give somebody a merit raise. Uh, I'll get the, the calls from a, a, from a sales side. Lots of times there's bonuses, uh, uh, there's extra commissions. Now, lots of times we would get the conversations of, 
hey, I'm only so far away from that next uh, level. You know, if if I don't quite get it, can I still get the bonus or something like that? I'll, I'll get a, the compromise conversation, but not from the uh, perspective of the of the uh, the prep. Now, I have used it before myself because prior to financial, I spent a few years in the corporate sales world uh, with IBM and they, they trained you on how to work in the corporate environment and they trained you on approaching to ask for raises as you move through the, the corporate structure. And which, quite frankly, that's where I learned the technique of writing, writing the letter. That's amazing that they would do that training too. I feel like more of them need to. Well, back in that time, way back, so that was early on, that was back in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, the corporate America was looked a lot different than it does today. You know, you know, not so many people had their corporate jobs and were looking for a side gig because they're trying to supplement their income. Back then, it was you, you, it was the 20 years, get the gold watch and the banner and the stock options, and that's that was the career. Well, those jobs in this day and time is, is almost non-existent. That this that, that world doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But they were really grooming corporate executives at the time, and that was part of the training, not only on how to sell and present, but how to function in the marketplace as a sales rep from how do you, how do you travel, how do you run a territory, and also how do you advance in, into management. So that was part of the training. Well, you've trained a lot of sales individuals, right? Fifty thousand sales individuals. And so a lot of this, do you feel like plays with sales as well? Like you're almost selling yourself when you're going into these conversations. Well, there's no question that the training that I received coming through both corporately and in, independently from some, just some terrific mentors and people that were willing to share with me has been valuable. And in being able to turn and then share that, the trick is when you begin to, whether it's training in sales or leadership, the trick is you want to give people information in a way that is relative to them. So many people train on what they think is important, and that might be true, but I want to train on what you think is important because that's the information you're going to hear and you're going to learn. Mm -hmm. So when we do training, we're always finding out from the sales group we're working with or the individual, you know, what is it that you need? to know to be better. And that's what we train on. It's not an agenda of, hey, these are the five things you need to know. And once you know these things, everything's perfect. And here's your training. Ours is, okay, that's the basic that sets you on course. Now, what are the things that you need to help with so you can get more comfortable? Because sales training, when it boils down to it, at the root level is all about two things, confidence and belief. We can train people to be stronger in those two areas then they can go do anything. They can sell anything, they can present anything, and they can share anything. Mm -hmm. Do you think that translates to people that are working in corporate America too? I think to some degree, it'll it'll help. Because you don't get to control your future in corporate America because it's controlled by the next person ahead of you. You've got to transfer or somebody has to get fired or, or pass away or get promoted, and then you get a shot at the slot. It, it, some of that's kind of scheduled that way. So no matter how, you know, ambitious you might be, no matter how aggressive you might be, sometimes you just got to wait your turn. However, this whole notion about belief and confidence, that has everything to do with when you do get the opportunity, if you are very confident in what you're doing and you have a high believability in what you stand for and how you do your or how you perform, then that will put you in a better position to compete for that for that slot. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that I think we've ever really talked about mindset as like a driving force in these conversations. I do remember one guest that touched on it briefly, but do you think that mindset is like a huge factor that someone should be focusing on as well as like preparing and laying all the groundwork? I, I think mindset's where it starts. If you begin to think like the person that is in the position that you want to be, it's almost like the old dress for success routine, right? You know, you dress for the job you want, not for the one you got. Well, let's think like a CEO. Let's think like a vice president. Let's think like an area manager. And when I get ready to vie for that position or that raise, then I'll approach it as they would critically think through that. If I'm trying to get a CEO job and I'm still thinking like a junior vice president, I'm probably not going to present 
in the same way that someone that's thinking like that person would present. Right. So mindset is, and to me is more than half the battle. And that includes your, you know, of course your attitude and, and your ambition, but I believe it has more to do with intentionally um, making moves that puts you in a position to ask for the job, the raise or the next thing that you might be seeking. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Okay. So I have a question and I usually ask most of our guests this question and it's where I'll ask if you have any stories that you might share about getting a raise, someone that you know, or that you actually went through. So do you have anything and can you tell us what happened? Well, there's a lot of things I can tell you. Some you'll laugh at, some you won't, but I'll tell you this. (laughs) I can, we spoke of, and and so many times on, on podcasts or, or recordings or shows, you always want to hear, well, let's hear about the success story, how you (laughs) went from rags to riches or whatever the case might be. Well, I think there's as much lesson sometimes in the ones that we don't get. So um, if it's okay, I'll tell you about a raise I didn't get. I would love it. (laughs) Because uh, it has to do with something we spoke of earlier and that was timing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take you back way back in time. And, um, it was my first paid job ever. And I was only 17 years old at the time. I was still in high school, but I got a job on a radio station as a disc jockey. Nice. And it was, I had one show a week. It was for six hours on Sunday morning. It was from six in the morning till uh, 12 noon. It was in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'll never forget. It was WRNC, the rock of Raleigh and uh, the whole the whole shebang. Well, what was interesting now, I was getting paid back that time, a whopping $2 and five cents an hour, which was the minimum wage back in the seventies, which that really dates me, but it's still a funny story. It is. That's awesome. So, I'm racking up the massive dough, you know, as this <laughs> you know, upcoming uh, DJ. Um, but what happens is in that show, the first five hours from 6 a.m. to 11, it was just a regular radio show. It was the John Dalton show uh, every Sunday morning. I think I had like, I think 12 listeners, you know, mom and a couple of friends around the neighborhood would get up and listen. But we, we would have this show and it was just commercial. You read the news every hour and the weather on the half hour and you played uh, top 40 music. But the last hour, Amanda, of the show from 11 to 12 was the live Presbyterian church service from the downtown First Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, which was a big church. And that's the old school, all the old Raleigh money and all the old families and the blue bloods. It was it was the deal. And so they broadcast their service through the radio station. And you had at that time this little intro tape, very much like the intro on your podcast, where it was 15 seconds of a recording and you would push the button. The recording would say, you know, welcome to the church service. We're going to take you there now where the services are just beginning. And at that moment, you were trained, if you were running the board at the radio station, to uh, you you push this little button, it would open up this two-way, almost like a two-way radio at that time, but it would open up the line, and you could hear the sound coming from the church through the channel, which was pumped out over the radio. So it was called the, the you opened the line. And, we, and there was always an audio person at the other end, and they were managing the sound on the church end, and... I was, of course, in the station. Well, they always told you to play that tape, that intro tape, somewhere between, you know, three minutes to 11 to the top of the hour. And because the organist, of course, as you know, in a church, traditional church service, they're playing the organist. People come in and sit down. So the music will be playing. Mm -hmm. But they also told you at any time, if you're on air on a radio station, back then it was still wax records, believe it or not, 45s and the big ones. So this is really taking a second time. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. They told you to have a record, what they call queued up. Now queued up record was on the turntable and you had to spin it. So just so you could hear the beginning of the sound. So as soon as it started playing, the sound would pop because on radio, and if you're going to go off the air for any reason, have any quiet time, it has to be either uh, documented or you have to, you have to warn people, look, this is going to be dead air. Like when they say we're going to, have a test of the emergency broadcast system and, and you play your test. Right. The dead air on a radio could signal there's something severely wrong, like some kind of a national emergency or something. And the FCC that monitors that 
that's serious. They'll shut a station down. They'll find the owners and general managers and everybody else to boot if there's dead air. I did not know that. Well, I didn't either. <laughs> so well, here we are at the church service. This time is three minutes to 11. I got my record queued up. Now, you'll have to pull this up on YouTube sometime and listen to it. But in 1974, which is when this was going on, the number one song on the top 40 charts was a, was a song called Midnight at the Oasis. And the uh, artist was Maria Muldar. I have no reason to know that song or that artist except for the fact of what got, got happened here. So I play my little tape. We're going there where the services are just beginning and I open up the church line. At that moment, there was nothing. There was no music. There was no organ playing. There was nothing. There was dead air. Oh no! And all I knew is that was bad. Right. <laughs> with my quick start training there, I, I said, oh yeah, play your record that's queued up. So I just reached over there and hit the record and starts playing the song. Mm -hmm. Midnight Athlete, put your camel to bed. It's probably not the most appropriate song they're playing in, in, the, in place of a church service, but it was music and it wasn't dead air. Uh -huh. So I'm take, taking a breath going, okay, I wonder what's going on at the church. And I was getting ready to pick the phone up and call and say, what's going on? But then I realized at that same time, I had not turned off the church key. So the open line, which had nothing coming my way via sound, I was pumping the sound not only over the radio wave, but back <laughs> down the line to the church and was blaring out in the sanctuary <gasps> of this church. Well, I didn't have to call the church because the phone lit up and it was the guy at the church going, JD, what's that there? Rock and roll music. You're pumping in this church. Cut that off. And so I panicked and all I did was I reached over and lifted the needle up off the record. Mm -hmm. He said, thank you. And so I'm like, okay. Problem solved. No, because once I pick the needle up off, now there's no sound coming out over the radio. Dead air. Dead air. Oh, no. Not five seconds later, the red phone rings. Think of watching the old TV show Batman having the red phone. Mm -hmm. Well, the red phone went off. And I knew what that was. And that wasn't the guy from the church. That was the owner. And I picked it up. And because this might be a G-rated podcast, I will not tell you what he said. <laughs> before what he told me to do, which is get something back on there right now. And we'll talk about it later. So when I, <clears throat> when I got a record playing and the, and then the church service started, I then was done for the day. Mm -hmm. Little did I know that I was getting ready to be done for my career because I'd planned on the next day coming back to the station and asking for my raise. I was trying to get to $2 and 10 cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And so I came back down to the station and I walked in and I, I was, sat with the manager. I said, and I hadn't written a letter. I didn't tell him what I wanted to do. I just came back down there and said, hey, sorry about yesterday. It will never happen again. By the way, I wanted to talk to you about maybe bumping my pay to 210 or 215 an hour. And I've been doing uh, this show now for about six months. And he says, we know I'm really glad you came in because we've decided to go in a different direction. And it's been nice having you. If we can have your keys, this will be uh the end of your employment here at WRNC. Oh, so timing was bad. Yeah, I didn't think through it. I didn't prep, and uh, I have to say, probably at that time, Amanda, I'm not sure a letter would have made any difference. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. the end of your radio career. Yeah. <laughs> It started in it pretty oh, quick. that's <laughs> such a bummer. Dead air. That, dead that, air. Dead air. That stinks so bad. That's a good story. That's a really good story. I like that a lot. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay. That was awesome. We all know that timing, timing is everything. That is one of the things that we have learned today. <laughs> So is there anything else that you uh, would like to add to our national conversation about getting a raise? Well, I'd say two things. Number one, um, if your if your um, plans for getting a raise um, don't come through and you don't get what you want, the next thing that I would always offer is there's a reason you're asking for a raise is you want more money. Well, consider today the world that we live in, and we kind of live in the gig economy where people have a side gig. Mm -hmm. Because like this podcast, it's virtual. There's lots of businesses that you can actually own or start yourself and make more money. So I would offer that to people as they're looking to their future is if I want more money and I can't get that raise, is there anything else I can do? 
Well, there's many, many options out there to become an entrepreneur, and there's lots of reasons to do that. So I would just say to your listeners is don't close your ears and, and don't close your minds to those opportunities. There might be one right around the corner that can help you add a few hundred dollars a month or or maybe to your to your paycheck. So there's sometimes more than one way to skin a cat. That's true. Can you tell us what you're up to now that's going to really make an impact on your industry or in your life in the next few years? Well, I can tell you what our hope is and our plan, because we had this uh, for what conversation about three years ago with two buddies of mine that uh, we we looked at this national, we, you know, we have this pandemic now, this unprecedented time. You mentioned COVID. Well, there's also another crisis going on in our country right now, Amanda, and, and that's the crisis of financial literacy. And in, in short terms, what we're talking about there is the, the mass of American public just doesn't know the basics of how money works. And I'll have to often add to that. It's not even their fault because it's not taught in schools. You know, the, the schools teach everything else but that. And there's only 17 states in the entire country that require any type of financial training in, in at the high school level or below. And yet we're the 14th wealthiest country in the, in the, uh, I mean, the number one wealthiest country in the world, but we rank 14th in financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So here's the massive problem. If you took the economy out there today and you looked at the population and we'll round it down to 300 million people, about 80 percent uh, make between 30 and 90,000 a year. That's just the average incomes of about 80 percent of our population. Mm -hmm. People think that it's the wealthy that run the country. It's not. The wealthy are wealthy and some have power. But the mass people, 240 million of the 300, they make between 30 and 90,000 a year. So here's what happens. If I'm a mid-level manager at, let's say, the power company down the street, and I make 60,000 a year as a mid-level manager, a good salary, I have a 401k and a health plan, I got a great deal. Well, here's the facts. Once I make my deposit into my 401k, if I'm contributing, then I pay my taxes, then I pay my rent or mortgage, my car payment, my Verizon bill, some food and clothes for the kids. Well, at the end of all that, I might have one, two or three dollars or three hundred dollars I could do something with. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. And because I don't know what to do, I typically don't do anything with it. And that means it usually gets consumed or squandered. Well, that's a problem because the masses are going to get to the end of retirement and they're not going to have enough. Right. So our thought was, what if we taught people how money works? And so we got together and we wrote a book and I'm going to make sure that um, I'll show you my book here on, on your screen. <laughs> I and love it. <laughs> how money works. Stop being a sucker. And the, the concept of the book was, how can we get this information out so people can ha and handle it? Well, here was what we did. Most financial books are written on a level that nobody wants to read. It's usually two or 300 pages. They're hardcover. You got to have a computer and a slide rule to figure it out and you don't understand it. So this book was created and written by two partners of mine um, that we all just kind of brainstormed on. But we wrote it on the level of a fifth grader. A mm -hmm. 10 year old could understand this if they read it. However, an 80 year old would appreciate it because the concepts, Amanda, in the book talk about the things that the wealthiest people in our country use to become wealthy. We also talk about the the gross injustices done to us by the financial institutions, like for banks. Mm. And I'll give you a really quick story. Um, if you go to a bank today and you walk in there to deposit some money into your savings account, you'll notice that the banks are paying a little bit less than most of the time, 1%. Well, we talk about in our book about how this works. Well, at 0.09%, Guess how long it takes for a dollar to turn to two dollars? A long time. <laughs> Eight hundred years. What? Eight hundred years. But yet, you've been to a bank and they'll loan out money at seventeen percent on the credit card, mm -hmm. or four percent in a CD, and um, the, so the the I mean, uh, interest on a on an equity line. So the point the point is, you're going to double over eight lifetimes. And they're going to double uh, every four to 17 years on mm -hmm. your money. Yeah. But yet we still give it to them. Well, guess what sits up in the little teller window right beside the, 
the place where you slide the money through. There's usually a little dish there in there. The suckers. <laughs> yeah. It's got candy in it yeah. and there's suckers in them. Because they're telling you what you're do- doing to you right there. In some of the banks, I won't mention the one that I go to often uh, by name, but I'll tell you this. They're so aggressive. Theirs aren't just suckers. Guess what kind of suckers are in the little dish? Oh, the dum-dum. Yeah, the dum-dum. <laughs> So they're telling us what they're doing to us and we still give them our money. And if people just knew that there was a way that they could become their own bank, they could do what the banks do for themselves, then now we're making a difference. And that's what we want to do. So the How Money Works book is all about teaching people how to do that, how to understand the basics and change their life financially. And we do two things with our company. We teach people those secrets, which the banks won't teach them. So they can use it for their own benefit. We also teach people how to be entrepreneurs. So what if you wanted to be in that industry and be in the financial world, which is the biggest one on the planet? It's bigger than retail and real estate put together times two and make a living helping other people understand how money works. So that's what's going on. And we're excited about it. And for any of your listeners that would like, we'd be more than happy. You can go to Amazon and buy our book. We're proud to say that since December, we've um, sold almost almost 450,000 copies just in the past six months. And we've been on national TV with the book and you can buy it on Amazon. But if you'd like for your listeners that want to reach out to you or you can have them contact me, we will send them a book uh, compliments of the um, raise up podcast, because we think what you're doing is a great idea. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. So what we'll do is we'll put that in the show notes. Um, If you just let me know where they can contact you, what's the best way to get in touch with you so that people can, can uh, get their book. I'll do it. As a matter of fact, we'll, we'll let them contact to our general website and they can click here. We'll send them a book and they can uh, learn the secret so they can go in and not be a sucker. (laughs) I love that. Not a dumb dumb either. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, JD, Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been incredible and you are so insightful. I really appreciate it. Well, this has been fun for me and and I do appreciate you taking me back in time and and, and having me go down the the DJ uh, road one more time. And the story is old, but it doesn't ever get old to to remember. Memory lane. Memory lane. And we learned a lot about dead air and timing for yes, sure. We <laughs> yes, we did. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you guys for listening. If, uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, you can subscribe, you can share with your friends, you can click the share button and take a screenshot and share it on your social stories and tag me at Amanda LaFever. Thanks again for listening. And thanks again, JD. Uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. <laughs>